you know, the superpowers of this technology that are making the rich richer and the smart smarter, like could be rectifying a lot of the injustice in the world. And nobody, very few people were like thinking about that. So mm -hmm. I was feeling challenged uh, that I need to step off my easy, like just make a name for yourself, keep mm -hmm. doing this cool machine learning path and try to do things that actually help other people. And that was something directly challenged by my faith. Welcome to Reenchanting, the podcast from seenandunseen.com. I'm Justin Briley. And I'm Belle Tindall. And we talk to interesting people about the way in which the Christian story has shaped our world and whether a secular post-Christian culture can be re-enchanted with the wonder and mystery of that story again. So if you're watching on YouTube, do, do make sure to like, subscribe, share today's show and do leave a review if you're listening via podcast. It helps others to discover re-enchanting. It certainly does. And for today's episode, we have Professor Rosalind Picard joining us. Um, Professor Picard is the founder and director of the Effective Computing Research Group over at MIT, which is where she's joining us from this afternoon. She has pioneered the field of life-saving wearable technology that responds to human emotion and well-being. She is an expert in machine learning and AI, a field that, of course, has exploded in our public consciousness recently, moving from the world of sci-fi very much into our everyday reality with the advent of ChatGBT and other numerous interactive AI programs. So we're going to be trying to make sense of all this with AI uh, and <laughs> with Roz as well on the show today. What does it all mean for the future of humanity? How do we ensure that technology doesn't dehumanize its creators? Uh, Roz, of course, approaches these questions not only as a computer scientist, but as a Christian who underwent an adult conversion. Um, so today we'll be asking how we can re-enchant AI and technology in a world where the human touch seems to be being replaced often by automated chatbots and virtual relationships and so on. Mm, but before any of that, before we dig into the, the existential stuff, um, our first question is always the same because usually our backdrop is much more impressive than mine is right now because we're on the top of Lambeth Palace, Lambeth Palace Library to be exact. And so our first question is always library themed and it's what are you reading currently? Well, as an academic, mostly what I'm reading is a stack of PhD theses. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. Very cool latest technology. How, however, I was just reading uh, or am still reading, I haven't finished it yet, a book called The Spirituality of Imperfection. Mm. The Spirituality of Imperfection. Explain a little bit more, Roz. What, what is The Spirituality of Imperfection? It, it's it's a book that focuses on storytelling and the search for meaning, bringing together mm. wisdom, stories of many different traditions and faiths. And it uh, it's it's crafted to help people find meaning and joy in suffering. Uh, it's a colleague gave it to me as something that is has been particularly profoundly influential in the Alcoholics Anonymous okay. and substance abuse communities for helping people uh, think about uh, meaning and purpose from something much greater than themselves. And uh, we are trying to do a lot of work to help such individuals now. So this is uh, good for me to get that perspective. Rose, have, you know, you, you're, you're an expert at writing computer programs. Have you, have you ever thought of writing a book yourself? Uh, I have written uh, a book uh, that uh, actually is something that was quite a while ago. So the uh, it's not like on the current bookshelves, but the book is called Affective Computing with an A, hopefully nicely confused with effective computing. Mm. And uh, now there's a, actually a whole area of computer science and uh, research called affective computing. Well, we're going to talk to you about all that in the course of the show, mm. but First things first, how can we be sure we are speaking to, to the real Ros Picard and not some AI avatar? Because it feels like we, we're never quite sure these days. I have uh, wondered that myself sometimes, looking at people on Zoom. In fact, when I uh, first taught on Zoom during the pandemic, I told my students, if you're replacing yourself with an avatar and fooling me, I want you to know that I'm giving the grade to the avatar. Uh, <laughs> <Very good. so. laughs> I, I I do wonder how many teachers these days are actually grading chat GPT rather than their students when it comes to the work. It, it is, it is happening. Yeah. It is happening. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. There, there you go but um yeah that, that's the world we live in isn't it and um i i guess we'll we'll come on to the way things have just seem to have accelerated in the last year or so Ros, in, in a moment's time but um tell us tell us a bit more about that background of yourself you're, you're sitting in your your office at MIT um you have mm-hmm. been there for many years and you developed this this yeah f- effective computing research group at MIT what, what is that first of all effective computing with an a hopefully nicely confused with being effective is about computing that relates to arises from or deliberately influences emotion when I first started this area, I was thinking about making machines more intelligent and giving them skills of emotional intelligence. So they could see things like, oh, did your eyebrows go up? Do you look interested? Uh, or the most common emotion with technology, you know, is these are frustrated. <laughs> are they really mad at the computer? And in order to um, have a more fluent human computer interaction uh, that was truly intelligent, I thought it would need at least these abilities to recognize and respond to displayed human emotion. Mm. So, so how, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. So, um, so how has that developed in the years? You know, where did you begin and where are you now? We began with some of the earliest machine learning, which interestingly is what people call AI today. But at the time when I taught it, I said, this is not AI, this is mathematical function approximation. Uh, Cause AI was about, like how the human brain uh, constructs meaning and has semantics and stuff. And what we were doing was really just math, high dimensional, Mm. lots of input data from video, sound, uh, behavior, and uh, we added physiology. And then the computer, people would give it labels like, oh, that's what somebody does when they look interested, or, oh, that's a sign of stress. And then the computer would take those labels from people and figure out how to match those inputs to those labels. That's where we started. Today, that has advanced really far. There are uh, commercial systems in use for things like facial expression recognition uh, by, I think, more than a third of the global Fortune 500 companies. Uh, Every major tech company that I know of has an affective computing group where they're thinking about the experience of their customers, not only by surveys, but like by what you're clicking on, your sentiment analysis, uh, does the caller to the call center sound super annoyed? You know, we need to escalate them a little bit more quickly to somebody more compassionate and hopefully also thinking a lot more about their employees who are serving those people. Um, if, If you're working in a call center, you don't want to get five in a row angry customers. Maybe it would be nice if we load balanced a little bit based on how pleased or displeased the customer sounds. Yeah. So is that the kind of way in which the research sort of has developed since since you began it in that sense, Ros? It's it's about helping companies, institutions to sort of, I guess, respond more effectively to people um, based on the, the sense of, of how they're feeling and, and that kind of thing. I distinguish how they're feeling from what they're displaying. Okay. Uh, the computer cannot, and I don't want to get boring here, uh, but let me still choose my words very carefully. The computer does not know what you're feeling. The computer knows what's what it is seeing and not that it sees like we see, but, but what the input data looks like on your face, vocal pitch changes, speed of talking, uh, are your gestures upward and bouncy or are you kind of like sunken and mm-hmm. slow and dragging? Uh, that can be detected from how you're walking, that can be detected from the motion parameters in your video. Uh, The video also actually can read your heart rate and respiration from things you and I can't see right now in the video, but the computer could if we gave it the ability to do that. It has the ability, you have to consent. Uh, And there's all these things it can process. Um, And then it's really up to humans interpreting it in context, uh, what is done with Mm. that information. That, that, but so in the end, obviously, there, there's still a human element to this, that there's still a human who mm-hmm. has to kind of decide what to do with the information the computer has sort of managed to capture in, in, in that sense. That's right. That's right. The computer has no, you know, we talk about AI learning, but it doesn't know anything. <laughs> it doesn't, not only does it not feel anything or know what we're feeling, it doesn't know anything. It has no mm-hmm. self. It has no awareness that mm-hmm. it's 
on or off or mm-hmm. whatever. I mean, you could have a print of statement saying I am on, right? Yeah, Giving yeah, the appearance of yeah, awareness, yeah. but it doesn't have anything like that. It won't do anything if we don't give it the ability and the instructions to do that thing. Mm, which is, I must admit, just on the forefront of this, that I know little about AI beyond the headlines, which is why I'm really excited about this interview in particular. But so being from that place of a place where I know the meta narrative and the mainstream narrative, that's different to what we're being sort of fed, which is that AIs have a sense of self that they can learn, that they are that they can exist outside of human operation. But you say that's not this not quite as apocalyptic. Well, we, we do deploy them. Uh, we give mm-hmm. them a certain amount of autonomy, but that is given by us. Yeah. And if we pull it away, it goes away. It's uh, they are not alive. They are not evolving on their own. If we yeah. were to stop what we're doing today, none of them are going to take over the world. Uh, <laughs> they they can't. Yeah, I mean, those are for the movies, right? Sure. That makes amazing drama. Uh, that's a lot more exciting than me explaining what they're actually able to do, which is subject to what we uh, enable them to do. Well, what about the the other aspect of what you've developed as well in your work, which is this wearable technology? Do you, do you want to just give us a sense of, of what that has looked like and some of the applications you've put it to? Yes. Originally, we built wearable technology so that we could understand people's affective, emotional state changes when they were in real life. Uh, we were measuring emotion, actually using this first uh, device. Yes, th- th- this is a bit of show and Cleaning tell, up my background. For, yeah, for so, people watching on video, what, just, just uh, for those what who is this? Honest, yeah, so, should tell us what you're you're holding in your hands this here. This clunky old uh, device. Uh, this device is called a Syntograph. It was developed by Manfred Kleins, who's since passed away, but he uh, he's probably most famous for his coining of the word cyborg in a 1960, I think it was 1960 paper with Kleins and Klein. And uh, Manfred was using this uh, with people pushing the button and measuring the dynamics of how you push, like when you're when you're angry and it's kind of mm. like the sharp thing, mm. um, when you're feeling joy. He actually said there was a little problem with joy because he was only measuring pushing. And with joy, you feel like lifting. He needed another mm. dimension of oh, it. Okay. And, and other um, of these uh, dynamic patterns. And I saw that and I was like, wow, there's actually repeatable different ways people press. He was also an amazing pianist, has a mm. fan letter from Einstein for his piano playing, among <laughs> other uh, fun facts about him. The um, When I read that and thought it was a l- little crazy at first, I realized that emotion is manifest in us through just about everything, not just our face and our voice and our gestures, um, our muscle tension, the way that we pick up a glass of water, uh, an actor or actress knows, like the way you pick it up when you're acting angry is different mm-hmm. than the way you pick it up when you're acting thoughtful. Mm-hmm. And so this these adverbs that modulate everything we do are now able to be measured. And we realized that the emotions we were eliciting with Manfred Syntograph in the lab were uh, interesting. We could get different patterns and we would measure people's physiology while doing it. Um, But one day, one of our uh, persons in the study said, you know that anger I experienced pressing the centigraph? Well, that was nothing compared with when I left the lab and was talking to my boyfriend. (laughs) (laughs) And, And we realized that what we were measuring in the lab was just not gonna cut it. To really understand emotion, we needed to put the lab on the person. So we built the first wearables that could measure physiology uh, comfortably when you left the lab. And some of them were pretty clunky, you know, big things duct taped to people's arms and antennas on our heads, transmitting data back to the uh, lab and all this craziness. Uh, We also built some of the first uh, wristwatch physiology sensors uh, for heart rate, skin conductance, motion, temperature, and late, much later, those were commercialized by well-known companies as smartwatches. I'm wearing two that have been commercialized and cleared by FDA by a company I co-founded called Empatica, which is Italian for empathetic. Um, and ours were built originally to capture data for research. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we accidentally had some very surprising findings that uh, changed the course of our work. Mm. Mm-hmm. What, 
Well, well, it, it's it's a fascinating story because I know that you know in in some cases this this has been the difference between life and death for some people, hasn't it? But just just describe sort of one or two examples of of how that that's come to be, Roz. Yeah, um, as we were trying to understand emotion, we realized there were groups of people who have difficulty understanding emotion, uh, and uh, working with in particular people on the autism spectrum. Uh, where I had read they have difficulty understanding people's emotions. Uh, one day, one of them said to me, Roz, you have it all wrong. Uh, my biggest problem is not understanding other people's emotions. My biggest problem is you're not understanding my emotion. Mm. And I, I felt like about this big. Um, and I said, I'm so sorry. You know, um, what am I not understanding? And she said, uh, it's not just you. It's everybody's not understanding my emotion. Uh, and they're not understanding my stress. And I realized that while, you know, almost all of us are pretty good at hiding stress outwardly or not, <laughs> sometimes we're leaking it and we don't realize it. Um, many people were being very misunderstood and many people on the spectrum have very atypical ways of showing it. So we realized these wearables that we were using for research to gather data might help somebody like her communicate their misunderstood stress to other people, if we could build it in a way that she could control it and share it and so forth. So we built that. And one day a student in my lab wanted to borrow those sensors we built uh, for his little brother over Christmas. And so I gave him a couple. Uh, I gave him two because I thought one might break because they were hand built. Mm -hmm. And um, I was back here looking at his data on my laptop. Um, and most of his data looked really low, like chill, kids having a great break. And I go to the next day and the data is so peaked that I thought the sensor must be broken because we do expect a peak with stress. Uh, we have measured peaks of Boston driver stress and all kinds of um, qualifying exams and things here, um, but I'd never seen a peak that big. And after trying to figure out how the sensor was broken, I gave up because it didn't, it wasn't following the usual mm. explanations. And I'm an electrical engineer and, you know, like should be all these things. <laughs> well, so I called him up old fashioned debugging. <laughs> hey, do you know what happened? How's your little brother? You know, what happened to him on this day or whatever? See, his little brother was non-speaking autistic. Mm. Uh, and I learned that his little brother had a seizure then and that he had written down exactly that moment. And uh, that got me curious about, you know, seizures. What, like, why is a seizure? And, and in this case, it was showing up on one wrist and not the mm -hmm. other. Like, how mm -hmm. on earth can you have mm -hmm. enormous stress on one side of your body and not the other? You know, my left wrist is stressed today, but the rest mm -hmm. of me is fine, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Well, turns out there's interesting changes in your brain that can trigger the response that we thought was stress at a particular point on the body. So this led to a whole new line of inquiry where um, today, actually, this device I'm wearing is FDA cleared to detect the most dangerous kinds of seizures, the generalized tonic-clonic seizures that, that can kill people. Uh, and people are much more likely to, uh, to, well, they don't usually kill people, fortunately. Mm. Um, but in the minutes following a seizure, when you think it's ended, it's very important to be with a person who's mm. just had the seizure. Because uh, in those minutes, changes can happen in the brain that can turn off your breathing and uh, if somebody's there to stimulate you, uh, give first aid, you have a significantly higher, some numbers say 65 times odd ratio, higher probability of being alive if wow. you're not alone at that time. Okay. So our device alerts uh, your caregivers, uh, gives them your GPS if you choose to share that. And hopefully they get there fast. You need to share a caregiver, let, let your caregivers know to uh, how to get to you fast. Mm, that's so amazing. I imagine that you're in a field where answers breed more questions um, and it's like this ongoing sort of exploration. So where, where are you at now in that what if all the findings and the twists and the turns and some expected, some not, what kind of questions is that fueling now in sort of the foreseeable future for you and your work? Well, we're always learning from the people that we're trying to help. 
Uh, like when I went into autism, I read all these papers thinking, okay, now I know a lot about how to help them. And after a week hanging out with about 50 of them at a retreat, it was like, holy cow, I've learned much more from these hours with them than from every technical paper I read. Mm -hmm. So first of all, it's showing respect for people in need and really listening and trying to learn what they want and sometimes completely changing what you're doing because what they need is not what you thought they need. Uh, mm. One of the things we've learned people really need and want in the epilepsy community is more control over when these seizures come out of the blue. Ideally, there would be no more seizures, uh, but a third of people still have them with uh, the best medications. So we have been working with other researchers who've actually been taking another one of our devices that's uh, um, that Empatica has been selling and using it to collect data to help them forecast. And if you could forecast that tomorrow you're you're in a state where you're not likely to have a seizure. You, usually people with epilepsy are not having seizures. Mm. Uh, most days are fine. So if we could figure out what's happening most of the time and help them stay in that mm -hmm. balanced state, then maybe they could get better seizure control. And there's some studies suggesting that. We've also been working with the Mayo Clinic and they have come up with a way to forecast uh, not for everybody, but for a subgroup of people um, when those uh, most dangerous seizures are happening. So we're working on more understanding of the patterns of health that might precipitate not only seizures, but other neurological events, also migraines, mm -hmm. and also depression and anxiety. We're doing a lot oh. with uh, mental health now, trying to help people understand like what keeps you in a good place, what knocks you out of whack. And which variables can we give you control over so that you have a better chance of staying resilient, building resilience and keeping resilience? That's amazing. Because again, I suppose with mental health, you know, any friends and family with experience, again, it's that so much of the stress and the trauma of that is not knowing, is having sort of not been able to forecast. So that just sounds like a, a game changing a game-changing mm. aid. Yeah, yeah, being prepared is huge. You know, a yeah. lot of women know this, like with menstrual cycles, right? If you can predict, you know, when that's when you're likely to have this extra stress in your life, mm. then you can kind of prepare yourself to have a better day and yeah. prepare those around you. Um, similarly, <laughs> if you could be warned that that's, you know, you're in a state that's much more likely to have a seizure, then you're going to be even more careful with your sleep, your stress, mm. your medications, mm. your, you know, mm. not not doing alcohol, you know, all these things that might uh, help you. And also to be in a safe place, make sure your caregivers are on call. Well, when it comes to the motivations, I know that for, for this work, and I love the way that the technology that you're invested in is so kind of, in a sense, human centered, um, Ros, it's, it, it's lovely, but the that the, I know that the motivation partly comes from your Christian faith, um, but you've got a bit of an unusual story in that respect because I don't think you particularly grew up with a with a Christian faith. How how did you sort of arrive at that place as an adult? <laughs> Not easily. <laughs> uh, there there's a, there's a longer version of this that was printed in Christianity Today, uh, but but very briefly, I was a um, I guess like a lot of kids who do well in school and think they're so smart, I thought religion was for people who weren't thinking. And I thought, I, I mean, I just kind of arrogantly dismissed it. Uh, I just made assumptions about people that were not right. Um, it was through meeting a uh, family that was very uh, intelligent. You know, he was a doctor and I babysat for them and they were cool and I liked them uh, and they kept uh, like things were going really well there. And then one day they invited me to church. <laughs> like, you go to church. <laughs> like this just didn't fit. Um, I didn't want to go to church. And I, uh, you know, as the weekend came closer and they were checking in with me, I decided I was sick. I had a stomach ache. I couldn't go. Well, the next weekend they tried again and I had a stomach ache again. <laughs> now, you can only fake sickness to a doctor so long, right, before they cut <laughs> on to you. Uh, and finally, after many weeks of my, uh, like, trying to get out of this, they said, you know, what matters most is not that you go to church. What matters most is what you believe. And have you read the Bible? Now, as a grade school kid who thought she was so smart. I did know of the Bible. I knew it was the best-selling book of all time. I knew how famous it was. 
uh, no, I hadn't read it. I had like a gold leaf version that I didn't think you really were supposed to read. And they um, suggested that I start with Proverbs, one a day for a month. And I expected the Bible to be full of all this ridiculous gobbledygook. Uh, I open Proverbs and start reading. And because I want to be well-educated and have read the Bible, you can't be well-educated if you haven't read the Bible. Uh, so I started reading Proverbs and I was shocked that there was actually a lot of real wisdom in there, real intelligence. Uh, and so I read all of Proverbs and I started to realize maybe I was making some assumptions that weren't entirely true. And about that time, some of my friends were going through confirmation. They were reading, they had a version of the Bible that was more readable that you could read through in a year. And so I decided to read through the Bible in a year. Nowhere was I going to set foot in church, but I did start closet reading the Bible uh, every day for a year till I had read through the whole Bible. And through that process, which I then reread many times uh, over and over, I started to believe in God, which was not what I wanted to do. So then I decided to study some other world religions to see if maybe I was just a product of reading the Bible. If I read these other religious books, maybe I would um, believe them too. So I was trying to kind of fix my mm. uh, problem of becoming a believer. Um, so long story short, I went on quite a journey for many years, reading, exploring, visiting, meeting people from lots of faith traditions, trying to figure out uh, this stuff. And I went from believing in God to finally early in college, uh, accepting uh, Jesus as the um, as not just somebody I started to believe what he said, not just as a great teacher, uh, but giving him a much bigger role in my life, uh, where I realized it was pretty, uh, pretty amazing if you could actually hand over the reins. So mm. I did that. Yeah. And to that extent, was the scientific part of you sort of kicking against that to any degree? And I guess among your intellectual peers, was was that seen as a sort of, oh, dear, you've you've obviously, you know, had a moment of illogicality here, Ros, where you're believing these ancient myths and things. Um, uh, I mean, it was or, or, or is, is actually religious belief not so uncommon among the scientific communities that? There are lots of brilliant scientists who have deep religious and especially Christian belief. Um, Jew, I'd say Jewish and Christian um, and, and Muslim here. We have a lot of faculty and leaders at MIT who are not just like superficial believe because they were raised this way, but have adopted faith later after much reason, after much reflection after very rigorous uh, thinking. And in fact, if you go over and look at the main court of MIT, where, you know, these big imposing buildings, architecture with names etched in it, like Newton and Kepler and Faraday, uh, you'll find a lot of these great scientists were not just Christians because people were Christians around them. Uh, they wrote more, like Newton wrote more about his Christian faith than about uh, the calculus and the science. He was extremely thoughtful about it. So you'll find a lot of people really engaging and um, thinking through these in science. However, as a grade school kid, my notion of science was very superficial. I kind of believed this bipolar, like it's science or it's God. Uh, you can't have both. And in fact, that's just so completely broken, right? Such a naive and um, poorly understood uh you know, fake dichotomy. Mm. Can I ask you about that then in particular, how your your work and your research and just your general sort of uh, scientific sort of leaning mind, how that has been fueled by your faith, but also how that on also vice versa, how that has then fed back into your faith? Yeah, I haven't found any conflicts between science and my faith. I did think there were some in third grade while I was an atheist, uh, but I um, haven't found them as a as a practicing scientist, as somebody who reads science for fun on the side. Okay. I have um, found my faith, however, influences significantly how I choose to do certain things and what I choose to do. Okay. What what sort of things would you say it, it's made a difference in, in that sense then? I mean, you, do you anticipate you might have gone in a different direction in terms of your research and the, and mm -hmm. so on? 
Yeah, and it's it's interesting also on the topic of AI because originally what was cool that drew me to AI was, you know, can you build a machine that can do everything the human mind can do, right? That can do everything we can do. And there were lots of reasons to do that, right? One is this egotistical, like we just want to build something that is so far better than us that, as my colleague Marvin Minsky said, we'll be lucky if it keeps us around as household pets. <laughs> now, you know, all these great people in AI were saying that. And so, you know, they attract a lot of people to work on that. But if you really sit back and think about, do I really want my legacy, my grandchildren to say, it's because of my, my grandma that we are all like reduced to no status in this world. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I think we need to rethink this. Um, there are other cool reasons to do it, right? Because the more that you um, try to understand the mind and you try to synthesize and build things, the better the questions you ask about it, the more you model something well, the more you understand it, the more useful those models can be for health and lots of other important things that actually uh, dignify human beings and are good for us. So there are really good reasons to do it that can um, affirm and uh, support humanity. Uh, and sometimes the work looks the same in those cases, uh, but it's just very much the framing and the purpose and what you're doing with it that is different. So I was drawn to understanding how the human mind worked and was trying to build that. I still am drawn to that, but I realized in doing that, that we could be doing so much good for people in the world, not just for our resumes mm -hmm. and for our uh, you know, publication. Mm -hmm. Some young people are like, oh, I just want to do this thing that makes it easy to get published. Mm -hmm. I realized from scripture that we're supposed to be helping those who uh, who aren't so strong, who are, where there's injustice. We're supposed to be getting rid of injustice. We're supposed to be doing things, that, you know, with the people that nobody around me even knows. They, they don't, they, but some of these people don't go to church. They never meet anybody who's not uh, like them, super smart, well-educated, all that stuff. Uh, but in my church community, I meet the homeless. I meet the poor. I meet people who really have it tough in life. Uh, I meet lots of people who are disabled, lots of foster families and youth, and they're being left out. They, they, you know, the superpowers of this technology that are making the rich richer and the smart smarter, like could be rectifying a lot of the injustice in the world. And nobody, very few people were like thinking about that. So mm -hmm. I was feeling challenged uh, that I need to step off my easy, like, just make a name for yourself keep mm. doing this cool machine learning path and try to do things that actually help other people. And that was something directly challenged by my faith. As one of the pastors used to say, uh, actually, this is a priest used to say um, that the role of the church was to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Mm. <laughs> and I was feeling, I've been quite afflicted by what I've read in the scriptures many times. Mm. 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 That what you said there about um people being left behind it made me think of that quote and I think it's William Gibson but if I'm wrong apologies to whoever it was but he said the future's already here it's just unevenly distributed um which is really really wise have you and, found and unjustly distributed yeah absolutely and unjustly distributed have you found on the flip side that the more you've looked into the inner workings of human brains and our bodies and and all of those that then that has fed into your faith because actually Mm -hmm. you know, this this holistic sort of deep dive into humanity has then sort of done the reverse as well. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, that used to be the first thing I would say when asked about uh, faith and the science is the more we ask questions and learn, it's it's not at all like grade school where there's just an answer in the back of the book and you're done <laughs> onto the next question. In science, you ask a question, you get an answer and it opens up 15, 20 new questions, each one which opens up more. Uh, as people know, like from looking at a microscope, you need an even more powerful microscope. There, there's always something deeper, whether you're going smaller or whether you're going larger. It's jaw dropping. It's awesome. Uh, one um, neurologist I met with at an epilepsy conference recently pulled me aside and he said he was uh, he was starting to become a Christian. And I said, you know, what what happened? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, in addition to, to reading and researching a lot of things, he's just been consistent. He, you know, he goes inside people's brains, you know, and measures and does stuff. And he's just been so consistently blown away 
by how amazing the mind is. The more he learns about it, the more awe, the more uh, reverence for what uh, how, how we are made. And I find that all the time. Uh, it's just amazing that our bodies and brains work, <laughs> you know, as well as they do. And by the way, I'm speaking as somebody who got a cancer diagnosis recently and has just oh, gone through gosh. treatment. And I, I still am blown away by how well as you learn the mechanisms our bodies use to repair things. Mm. It's astonishing. It is so complex. It is just jaw dropping. And I've, I've been the recipient of great care, yeah. the great prognosis. So don't don't worry. I just well, well, no, throw it in to say that I'm not like some Pollyanna who's not sure. seen bad stuff, you know? Absolutely. I mean, it might might be interesting maybe to, to talk through some of that in, in a moment. But I, I suppose all of this sort of, you know, fascinates me because on the one hand, I hear you telling that story of a neurologist who is sort of could have come to realize that that we're more than just the kind of physical components of our brain that there's something mysterious and unifying about about who we are in that sense that that seems to to need a transcendent cause at the same time you know you've got the advent of these new ai programs chat gpt and and all the others um where it feels like the the sort of the more kind of materialist sort of philosophers out there are saying well look we're we're finally unraveling, you know, at a digital level how the human works. This is kind of this is somehow we're 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 going to get to basically human level intelligence by tracing this this kind of pathway with with artificial intelligence and and almost saying, almost kind of going in the opposite direction to what you've just described, saying you know ultimately yeah human brains are basically just you know digital wetware. You know that that it, it, we we can mm -hmm. what we're doing we're finding in the computer thing. You know, we're, is you know we're we're discovering we're just another sort of in, intelligent sort of computation device almost. I mean, do do you just simply disavow that? Do you say that that's not your experience as a computer scientist that there's there is a big difference between human intelligence and quote unquote artificial intelligence? The, so there's a lot of things <laughs> in there. First, of all, I want to say that I think the accomplishments of ChatGPT and large language models are really impressive. Uh -huh. uh, they're they're very exciting. They are tool. I see them as tools, not as mm -hmm. minds. Okay. okay, these are tools. Just like uh, you know, if you're like the search engines and really smart systems, but but now the search engines you can, uh, you, you know, they, they can they can give you much more sophisticated natural language yeah. type of responses, right? Um, but if those were not given massive amounts of uh, properly worded uh, language, you know, from the hundreds of articles, you know, folks like me have put online and books and, you know, doctors and web page, you know, all this incredibly human crafted stuff, uh, they would have nothing, right? Right. When, when what they generate is uh, variations on what we've given them. Mm. So they're not minds. They're not uh, feeling, thinking, learning beings. They're not alive. They're incredibly sophisticated uh, statistical uh, movers around of words, <laughs> mm. okay, uh, based on what we put in. And that it's very impressive. Uh, they can pull off passing sophisticated tests if they're given the proper examples of inputs and outputs mm -hmm. for those tests. Uh, so it does make you question, you know, is that intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. Is a lookup mm -hmm. table intelligence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Knowing to look things up. Is that really intelligence? Uh, they don't have the kind of fluid general intelligence that that a child has, you know, of uh curiously figuring out the world and dealing with complex, unpredictable inputs and working without being trained on uh, data. So I have to be careful not to get too boring yes. in detail in an interview like this. Um, so I want to say what they've accomplished is really impressive. It has a lot of uses, um, but it should not be confused with, um, you know, what it is that we do when we're yeah. learning. Uh, yeah, and but it because, is good for sharpening some of the differences yeah. there, because there's a sense in which, yeah, uh, uh, as human intelligent agents, we we don't we, we don't have to be fed millions of articles in order to be able to kind of create and start to shape and to be able to sort of 
do things. Um, and and mm-hmm. I guess at, at bottom, exactly what you said at the beginning of the interview is that the computer doesn't feel sad. It, 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 all it is doing is passing on a set of data in a way that it's been told to, but it doesn't have any opinion mm-hmm. about that data. It doesn't itself have a judgment on whether the, you know, Shakespearean sonnet, you know, that it's just been asked to produce is good or bad. That's, that's a human in the end, who's going to make that judgment as to, as to how well chat GPT wrote, wrote that piece of. That's right. And yeah. humans, um, the reason billions of dollars have gone into this is to pay the humans who are shaping and curating and saying to chat GPT, that's not a good answer. You know, don't, don't take that path, right? Scratch that mm. one, do this. You know, they're, they're constantly trying to fix and shape and teach and mold. Same with the generative art. The humans are like, that's terrible. Hands don't look like, you know, humans are working on um, curating and shaping and giving those values and that feedback to it. It's not doing anything without the human uh, shaping it and giving it all the gifts, if you want to call them gifts or abilities that it has. Mm. That's you're a very calming, reassuring voice on this, particularly as someone who is a writer by profession, who's always told that I'm on borrowed time now. <laughs> I'm very much enjoying this. Is there is there anything about sort of developments as you're seeing them and you're seeing them you're sort of your your peeking behind the curtain because of where you're placed in a way that we're not. We're relying on media mostly, mainstream media to tell us the story. But is there anything from where you sit that is making you a tiny bit uneasy or nervous? Um, or is is are things just blown out of proportion at the moment? Well, they are blown out of proportion. If you look at the people blowing them out of proportion, they're all major shareholders and companies that the more press they get, the more right. their valuation goes up and the more uh, they benefit. Mm-hmm. So, you know, blow it out of proportion, right? They're they're going to uh, pocket it. So I, I do have fears of the power, uh, enriching the power of people who are out of touch with real needs in the world. And it's very easy to get out of touch with real needs in the world when you are immersed in the high tech, like constantly trying to stay up on what's happening culture with other sharp people trying to do the same thing. They're not rubbing shoulders with the rest of the world and understanding that when they hear the same news uh, you and I've been hearing that's blown out of proportion, um, Mm. they're often hearing, my days are numbered. I'm not needed anymore. I'm not of value anymore. I mean, one billboard I drove by coming in was like, okay, you might as well retire early. (laughs) Your future's gone. But before you do, buy a car from us, right? (laughs) You know, it's it's very, um, like, people are kind of trying to be lighthearted about it, but it's like underneath there's this deep existential fear that we're all becoming obsolete when they talk that way. And Mm -hmm. that is, that is so harmful. It, first of all, it's, a tool <laughs> built by people that should be used to help people, not to replace people. So one of the things that I've been trying to push on with, uh, and, and our lab is very focused on, is that AI could be built to try to replace people. It could also be built to really enhance human life. Mm. Uh, so as a writer, you might use it let's say you're having trouble uh, getting started on something or you're given like a boring test to write. Oh my gosh, I just need to write the answers to these commonly asked questions. This is kind of boring. Okay, chat GPT can help with that. Okay, Mm. it can help you get like the first draft and then you read it and you're like, this is really boring. This is really like the ordinary Mm. dry stuff. Now I'm going to use my sense of curation and gifts to customize it for this context, to jazz it up, to make it not so banal. And that's that's a way to work with the technology, right? Mm-hmm. There are lots of ways to work with it. Maybe I'm dry on some ideas for a crazy little skit we have to do. I ask for crazy skit ideas in this. It comes out with some really wacky things. That gets the juices rolling. We come out with something a little better because we bootstrapped our creativity a little faster with it. Uh, so those are ways I, I do think people are finding it speeds up their work that could, you know, um, that could reduce some jobs that we're spending a lot of time doing that. And we need to think about that cost. Mm -hmm. And is that, uh, are we freeing people up to do something more interesting? uh, Or are we, you know, really hurting uh, whole groups of people with that? And I I think there's some of both. uh, And we should be very sober and thoughtful about that. And then when we introduce a technology that 
does that, we should do a much better job than we, than we, the collective AI community have done mm -hmm. with preparing mm -hmm. society for it. Mm -hmm. Don't give them this, you'll be all, you know, this existential doom, um, but, but talk very frankly about what, uh, what could be done. And also, I think in some cases, there has been what I'll call AI malpractice, where people have released these things, let them say very harmful things, uh, things that are not true, that I know is not true when I interact with it. Mm. Like your average person doesn't know that. Uh, and there, there have even been suicides attributed Gosh, to wow. this, right? Yeah. Which is crazy malpractice, right? That AI people like are so excited about this, they just set it out and it does some harm. I mean, I saw a, an advert pop up on my Facebook feed. I don't know what this says about my algorithms, but it was advertising a, a virtual AI girlfriend. Um, and and this, this was basically, well, it was actually an article about virtual AI girlfriends, but apparently this is becoming a booming industry, okay? Um, mm -hmm. Because there are a number of people who just find it easier and happier to kind of interact with a virtual sort of romantic partner. Um, now, obviously a lot of people go, well, that sounds like a terrible idea, but you can understand why for some people it might be quite an attractive idea. What do you think about that kind of direction that the sort of literally replacing human relationships with virtual relationships? And, and even if we disagree with it, is there any way of stopping it at the end of the day? I mean, because it, in the end, it, a lot of this stuff is really driven by the economics of it, isn't it? Yeah. Than it any particular sort of social concerns. Yeah, it's driven by market forces. Uh, I've chatted with the uh, uh, founders of one of those companies quite a bit. And there are, there are, so, so let me go back to people on the autism spectrum who told me back in the days before these fancy virtual AIs, um, just with avatars and Second Life and worlds like that, uh, they, many of them found it incredibly helpful to practice verbal and social skills in these environments okay uh mm. that then gave them the confidence to uh go out and um, meet people in the real world and develop real online human relationships as well um actually in second life there were all humans behind those avatars yeah, i yeah. remember correctly uh but some of these ais uh have no human behind them right it's just an algorithm yeah. so there is an opportunity to practice some things and there can be good uses for that somebody can practice their interviewing skills we've built mm. avatars that help people with that and it's been shown that they actually do better in real human to human interviews with that practice so but but we don't want to fool them <laughs> right <laughs> i i start to draw the line where it says you know oh i love you you know and it mm. like starts to act mm. like it has feelings that it doesn't have or to manipulate your feelings which could be done for financial gain and other insidious uh, purposes as well. So I think we have to be super careful uh, what the purpose is. It's something that could be used for helping people, uh, but it's also something that can be very harmful, if, especially if it doesn't convert into healthy human relationships. Mm -hmm. I, I, go ahead, Bill. So it, it sounds like, which is what's really interesting, and I think I want to shout from the rooftops after this conversation, is it's not the technology that makes you in any way an easy or nervous, it's the narratives that we are writing around it and the narratives that are pushing it forward and the narratives that sort of we on the ground level, I feel like I can put myself there because I'm in no way in this, the world of development, are therefore kind of like subsuming. Is that sort of correct to say? Um, often. <laughs> okay. Often that's correct. It is, it is often that the technology layer itself is, is, powerfully able to be used for something great uh, and mm. for something not great. And okay. the narrative can, the use can, the economics, the market forces can push it in these different ways. I do think when we're designing it, we need to try to imagine not just the great uses, but the bad ones. And in okay. some cases that I'm not going to give you details on, my yeah. group and I have decided not to do certain things because I'm more worried about the downsides uh, I'm afraid they might be worse, uh, that they may not, you know, the upsides may not justify sure. the downsides. Mm -hmm. So, um, and those are often when the technology is put in the hands of somebody who really does not have people's best interests in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, um, 
That is a real worry I have. Uh, there are mm. people who will just use it for their economic gain and for their power, their governmental power uh, to suppress people groups. Uh, that is actively being done in our world today. Mm -hmm. And it's horrible that that's being done. If we could pull back that technology so they didn't have that superpower, uh, I would love to do that. But it's you can't. It's like mm -hmm. trying to put toothpaste back in the tube. Mm. Yeah. That decision, I think it's it's probably just because I went to go and see Oppenheimer this weekend, <laughs> which is, um, yeah. Uh, and I'm obviously two very different fields and I it's a bit sort of crass for me to even compare them, but that decision right on the edge where you think oh, progress for progress sake or no, absolutely not. Is that the, that is the pivotal, the pivotal moment, the moment that sort of changes things quite dramatically and trusting people to make the right decision in those moments is really what it's all about, I suppose. Yeah. And, and here, actually, the Christian worldview comes right back to the front, too, because we're it, it's not just that we're imperfect. Right. We, yeah. we all have some uh, deeply flawed mm -hmm. uh, characteristics. We need one another to call us out on it. We need to mm -hmm. maintain accountability and responsibility. Uh, we need to be responsible for the technology that we build and deploy and uh, not just say, Oh, it's being used poorly, right? This is really hard because once you, you know, once the patent or the paper is out there telling people how to do it or the open source code, uh, people can use it however they want. Mm -hmm. And I have with my companies, you know, put restrictions on things. If you use the software, you agree not to use it for mm -hmm. these purposes mm -hmm. and so forth. We hope people signing that are obeying that. Uh, mm -hmm. In our own lab, in our work, we only do anything with human data with prior fully informed consent, IRB approval, uh, ethics review board approval, and making sure that, uh, you know, we have all these checks and balances in place. Um, but there are other people in the world who there's no regulations. Well, I was going to say, I, they I can do what they want. I, I think, you know, your, your analogy there, Bell, with Oppenheimer and, you know, the proliferation of the nuclear arms race is it, it is quite appropriate in a way because it mm. feels like we're now in a kind of artificial intelligence arms race of sorts and the problem is we can put checks and balances on the way we use it perhaps if we've got a conscience in the west you know and we've got i know certain leading figures in the technology movement sort of asking for moratoriums and sort of breaks and you know checks and balances but that may not apply to other superpowers in the world. And, and so the question is, well, do we simply get left behind or do we just have to all kind of now be going at breakneck speed to, to what the next thing is on the horizon and, and hoping, you know, that we don't make some dreadful mistakes in the process? I, I mean, what, what's your feeling on that, Ros? Am I being too, too doom and gloom about what that future looks like? Um, well, I mean, we still have to worry about the bombs. <laughs> yes. Let's not say that AI is just replacing them. Sure. Uh, and also um, biological uh, yep. things that could go wrong that are really scary. I, I'm not quite as worried about AI as those other things, okay. but I am worried that the people we train here, that we teach, that we inspire with our work, the next generation of AI makers, as well as all of our current students, that they be thoughtful about not just am I building something cool and powerful mm -hmm. that advances the state of the art, but am I building something that makes the world better, mm -hmm. that mm. is improving people's lives? We we make the problem uh, more interesting, more challenging, more important. And I do think the more we cultivate people's desire to do good, to uh, create meaning, to um, affirm human dignity and worth, uh, which people know inside them, is, is true and right when when they're pulled back to reality. Uh, the more we focus on that and give people that to, to achieve for and strive for, the more we'll see technology uh, makers making the kind of decisions that hopefully uh, improve people's lives. Mm -hmm. in, in our last season, we did touch on the issue of artificial intelligence. So this is the first proper conversation we've had focusing on it, Roz, um, on the podcast. But the, the person we we sort of spoke about it a little bit with was actually a, an author and poet, Paul Kingsnorth, here in the UK, who himself is as actually an adult convert quite recently, actually, to Christianity. But he 
he was, you know, in a sense, some something of a prophet of doom in this area. In fact, he <laughs> likened the rise of AI to a sort of almost summoning a demon. You know, he said, we don't really, he, well, his view was we don't really understand what we're dealing with. We're kind of creating something that that could, in principle, we begin to kind of arrange itself in such a way that we we no longer really have full control over it. And to that extent, he wonders if there's a kind of spiritual component to this, you know, uh, that, that we're sort of literally creating a, uh, a, a a thing where where something malevolent could actually arise within it. Um, I don't know. Again, just be interested in your thoughts on whether you think that's yeah, like yeah. spiritual. Great bit sci-fi plot. Yeah, <laughs> great movie. <laughs> um, yeah, I I think the demon, if there are demons, they're in us. Uh, if if they're in the AI, it's because we program them in the AI. Uh, and I'm you, you know, that's um, it's it's an amplifier of us. Mm-hmm. It's it's giving people superpowers. It's not creating itself on its own out there, right? Remember, you know, if we don't program it and you know uh, give it electricity, <laughs> if we don't give it data, if we don't give it everything it needs to iterate to the next version, if we don't curate it and say that was a dumb answer, fix yourself. Um, not that it has a self. Uh, if we don't, it, we lack metaphors <laughs> in this space. Keep using mm-hmm. imperfect human ones. Uh, it, it's not going to become anything right, mm. without us. Uh, and that's not an arrogant position. That's just, we are its makers. So if there are, you know, demons and evil behaviors there, they, they're what we're enabling. But mm. I, I, I do hear some of these philosophers though, who, you know, I don't know, the Nick Bostroms and the, uh, another sort of futurists and so on, who, who do almost envisage a sense in which humans could, quite easily become obsolete and that actually we're, we're just one part in an evolutionary process that kind of you know goes from these biological people you and me to us uh-huh. kind of creating the conditions where a, a kind of digital you know mechanized kind of form of life takes over and and you know we we, we may be long gone and forgotten in the distant future when the the self-replicating robots and AIs are kind of the new form of life that's colonizing the universe. I mean, again, is it sci-fi? Yeah, or, yeah. The, well, or the the original that comes right out of the R U R, the original play that coined the word robot, right? Yeah. Uh, Rossum's Universal Robots, uh, that image. Um, a problem, and actually going back to that, in a very practical reality, is they don't self-replicate, fix themselves, work forever. I mean, what technology lasts more than a few years? Part of that is the inherent problems with technology. Part of that is the complexity and keeping all the pieces working. Part of that is the market forces. Nobody's going to build it if they can't make money to pay the people who are building it. And so this whole process has a lot of practical realities. Uh, And so while you might imagine that endpoint, once you start to flesh out what it actually takes to get there and keep it running, it falls apart. Mm. So there's obviously, again, there's all these headlines about leading AI specialists wanting to just pull the plug, uh, literally, but also figuratively, um, just say absolutely no more. But chatting to you, it, it, would you agree with that? Or actually, is it, you know, this podcast is called the Reenchanting Podcast. And actually, is it more about reenchanting technological progress and thinking about AI as something enhancing, as something um, to be made with empathy, and it's not just a case of, oh, you know, tools down. It's a choice what we make. Uh, mm. If we make it in a way that's, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of once I, I had a broken laptop. I called the repair people and I said to the guy, I'm pretty sure this is the problem, right? I work in a lab where we make all these things and fix these things. And he's like, I'm sorry, I can't let you tell me what problem is I have to go down this checklist of things and ask you all these questions. So after 30 minutes of him being a machine, okay, we (laughs) humans turned him into a machine, right? An algorithm. Um, He realized, you know, it was probably what I said and just send it in and they'll they'll fix that, right? We sometimes impose this um, machine-like state on people, whether it's by telling them a procedure to follow or by making them use some software that's really annoying um, or follow some processes that maybe were good intention to begin with, but we lost sight of, you know, the human experience and doing mm-hmm. this. Uh, we are capable of using technology and 
things in a bad way, right? And so some of that uh, happens. Uh, it is up to the makers and deployers and creators of this to constantly be checking in with human beings. Um, are we achieving a better experience for you? Are we having better health outcomes? Are you having a better experience as an employee in this company with this technology and these procedures? Is it really making things better? If not, what can we do to make it better? And so I'd say the real re-enchanting is to get back to our uh, human values, our human experience, and make sure that we're, sh we're responsible in shaping and recognizing that it's us who are shaping this technology uh, and not pretend that the AI is just going to go off and do its own thing and and replace us. Uh, mm -hmm. If we, when we allow bad things like that to happen, the blame is on us, not the technology. Such a helpful set of thoughts as we mm -hmm. start to wrap up this interview. It's been really great talking to you, Roz. Um, I, I'm I'm hopeful just by the fact that people like you are in this field and and you know making sure that the machine learning stays with the machines and we don't turn humans into a, another form of machine or anything like that. But um, it's, it's been really wonderful. What, what gives you hope for the future? I suppose, you know, uh, again, just to kind of give us a sense of hope in the midst of a lot of, as Bell said, apocalyptic headlines that often seem <laughs> to come at us when it comes to this, this whole field. Yeah. I, I do see uh, human beings who deep down inside desire to do good and to use the technology for good. Uh, I also see that we're blind, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're arrogant, uh, we make mistakes, we often mess things up, uh, we can really mess things up. Um, I think we have amazing abilities surpassed only by our arrogance and blindness. Uh, uh, however, fortunately, God is still in charge. And, uh, you know, many technology makers can ignore God, um, but God is not mocked. And um, we can't kill God. <laughs> so no matter how badly we mess it up, uh, God reigns and God can restore. So these things give me hope. Good, good note to end on. Thank you so much for, okay. for being our guest on Reenchanting. Thanks. A pleasure chatting with you all. Thank you so much. And uh, if you're watching or listening and you'd like to find out more about Roz and her work, we'll make sure there's a link from today's show. And uh, we always appreciate it, as we said at the beginning, if you can share uh, this show with others, uh, let other people know about it, um, tell them what a brilliant guest Roz was and make sure that they watch or download mm. the show on podcast uh, and find out more about our other guests and seasons at seenandunseen.com. But for now, Roz, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.